Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. You know the drill by now. If you don't, get involved in the comments under there. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech and fire away with your questions. They could be directed to me, they could go to Anna, they could go to Neil, Blake, Martin, Adam from EMBN, or even Jonesy if you fancy not getting a response. Uh, right, so we're going to crack on with questions for this show. Um, if you don't already subscribe, give us a like, give us a subscribe, and tell us, subscribe, give us a subscribe, and uh, tell your friends about us. Right, first question, this is an awesome one. This is from Rory Mal, who says, Doddy, what component and parts manufacturers would you use to build your own dream bike without the ties of GMBN sponsors? Tires, wheels, cockpit, everything. Well, first off, I have done some pretty cool bike builds. Uh, obviously, working with Shimano and stuff like that, but I have had free reign of everything I've put on the bikes. Uh, so if you haven't seen any of those, check them out. There's going to be links, hopefully, under there for those. But in the meantime, all right, so straight up, five dev cranks. Um, I'm just in love with them. I love that they're like brand new, they're modern tech, but they kind of have that little nod back to old ridiculous cranks from way back. Uh, they're absolutely beautiful, and those titanium cranks, oh my days. I'd have a set of those, 100%. Um, and obviously I saw those cranks when I built that Manitou bike, which will also hopefully be in a link down there. Please check that one out, it's ridiculously good. Chris King hubs, I've never had a set, I've not got round to getting some, so I'd have to have Chris King hubs. They're just a thing of beauty, and it's very rare that you have something in this world that beds in um, and doesn't wear out, sort of wears in to work better. I'd really like those Zip 3.0 Moto rims. I like the idea of the single skin rim, the ankle flex on them. There's a lot of things there that make sense to me. I like the fact they're made from carbon. I'm not adverse to that. Uh, but the tech that's in them, that really appeals to me. Um, SRAM Access, the new one. I would have the GX Mech. Um, I'd be tempted to lose the steel lower cage though. Now I know you can chop and change. I'm not convinced I'd need the SL. So maybe the XO cage or something there. Uh, I do like the idea of the magic wheels, so go for that on there. Uh, reverb, post, access, that thing is just incredible. And I've said this before in, I don't know, the Rockstress video maybe. If you're gonna have anything electronic and you only have one thing, make it that brilliant thing. Um, trick stuff breaks. Now I've only had a go on Neil's ones a couple of times and I think like a bike at the show and my experience of them is they are so powerful you may as well just stick a log in your front wheel. Uh, if I can only have one bike, I'd have a set of those brakes on there. Um, from what I gather from those that step between different bikes, they're so powerful that can actually disturb your riding if you're getting on to other brakes. But yeah, trick stuff all the way. Victoria Mazza's. 100% love that tyre, although I would have the race compound on the front on this on this bike, just because I love a super sticky front rubber tyre. Uh, but I can't floor them for what I do. I think they're great tyres. And I've kind of grown to love the grey sidewall as well, which I know some people are on the fence, but I think they look amazing. Uh, five Dev Titanium Stem, that thing's a work of art. Um, we've got one floating around somewhere, that thing is seriously nice. Um, I would ask Renthal to make me some of their ultra tacky grips in a single collar. I use those grips in the double collar, but it's such an old design now, I really want them in a single collar because I think they're amazing. Again, that's the sort of grip, I think I explained this in the bike build video where I built the Mondraker bike. Uh, they're so sticky, I like riding in wet conditions, well, don't have a choice, and also bare hands. So those combos together with the sticky grips, brilliant. I'd get Tyler from SDG to make me a custom Bel Air saddle. I always love the Bel Air saddle. It's got the coolest name as well, the whole Bel Air thing. Crank Brothers Mallet E pedals. Suspension, don't know, if I'm honest. There's loads of things I'd like to try. Um, the EXT Airshock, for example, I'd like to try that. Intend fork. I couldn't say if I'd commit to it, but I certainly want to try one, so yeah, why not? Frame-wise, I've got to say, looking at it now, Spectral 125, it's pretty close to perfect for me. What I like in a bike, geometry, yeah, it's, it's about there. I like those sort of bikes. The Mondraker Rays that I built, again, a very similar bike. That's 150, 130 rather than 140, 125. But those realms, and if it couldn't be one of those, another bike along those lines. Uh, that's really me in bike form. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's about the list. That went on a bit longer than I expected. Dodstar 1979, I'm a fan of retro bikes, as are you. I've got a Manitou fork in working order. Which current fork do you think will be as iconic as the answer Manitou's? Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, bearing in mind that back then, no forks were particularly good, so it's kind of based on how they looked. And the chiseled CNC machine look of the Manitou, I still think nothing else has ever looked as good as those early Manitou forks. I just think they're simply beautiful. Uh, 
of course, there's many better forks out there uh, these days. I would say the RockShox Pike is probably the nearest because it's almost a bit of a cult fork. So when the Pike arrived on the scene, we didn't know we needed the Pike. So RockShox developed a fork with the Silo, which was a mixed travel, mixed intention fork. And it was great, not brilliant, but then it quickly kind of moved away and they gave us the Pike, which was a little bit porky for what it was, but mixed travel and you could do anything on it. And it started making us think differently about the bikes we have. Now, of course, we're up to today with the Pike, which is just a phenomenal fork that's, again, spans genres. Don't forget, when it came out, you could run it as low as 110 travel and all up to 160. So it could be a cross-country fork all the way through to an enduro fork. Uh, and of course, everything is sort of widened out these days. There's more specific forks, but I think that's a bit of a cult fork. Check out my RockShox video, if you haven't already seen it, where I talk a bit about that and many other RockShox things, because that's definitely a brand that, close to the heart. Torque wrenches, I've had mine for ages. And over time, they can start to become less accurate, yeah. Um, have you recalibrated any of yours? And if so, how did you do it? Do you know, if I'm completely honest, I haven't. I rarely use torque wrenches. Uh, now, I think you're supposed to do them annually. We're talking like professional mechanic level here. Uh, annually or something like every 5,000 cycles of use. I'm not convinced mine have got to that point, if I'm honest. I rarely use them. I'll use them on delicate bolts, things that have got like four mil bolts, things like that. Or if I'm unsure, if it's like a big eight that needs cranking up, I might reference it, might check it. But I've got two or three different torque wrenches as well. Um, I did look online and basically tool specialists will calibrate them for you. It's the sort of service that car mechanics, motorbike mechanics and that will be doing constantly because it's like, it's critical for them to be correct. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm actually gonna, Look at mine to see if there's, if, see how far out there. I'd be quite interested to know. Uh, and I feel a bit bad about that. Uh, next one's from uh, Richard. Um, Richard tries for cake. I just changed my stock Cannondale bars and stem for a Renthal uh, bar and stem combo. My bike feels so much better. This isn't an upgrade people talk about, but I feel the bike handles so much better. Am I right or am I blinded by my new shiny parts? Uh, I think when, whenever you buy something new, whether it's a new pair of trainers or a new pair of handlebar grips you buy, there's definitely a bit of a honeymoon period in there where you love your purchase, you're really happy about it. So there's almost a placebo effect, regardless of what it's actually doing, that you're going to just love that product. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Love it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the confidence it gives you. But yeah, there is also the physicalities of uh, what's going on with them. The material that the handlebars are made from, if it was carbon or alloy, can have different attributes. The rise, the sweep, the back sweep on them, the width of the bar, how high you run them, all of those things all contribute to the handling of your bike. So if they're slightly different to before in any way, and you prefer it now, then it could well be that's your preferred thing. Either way, if you like the numbers on there, jot them down so you just know them for further down the line. And if you can't figure out why something that feels, like that is different feels wrong, it could be that. Uh, always worth noting this stuff. Yeah, well, at least that's, that's what I do anyway, on my own with chalk on the chalkboard. Yeah. Um, Shikaka 1984 says, my lad is getting a new mountain bike next month, uh, which, I, um, which I've got, but I'm trying to find some kids pedals in yellow and some grip shift compatible grips again in yellow. Right, pedal wise, I did have a look um, before filming this, because there's loads of people that make great kids pedals, but it turns out I could barely find any yellow ones, but uh, one-up components do. Uh, so check those out, they're fantastic, they're small size for small feet, and they look really good as well. So uh, there's gonna be a link in the description under there to one-up components. Uh, it might not be where you're based, but you'll be able to find a distributor or something, hopefully. Grip shift grips, a little bit more difficult to find. So when grip shift was more popular, uh, ODI and various other big brands used to make them, but all I've kind of struggled to be honest. So there's these ones on screen from Trek. They say they're kids grips. There's not much detail on them, but they are yellow. They look orange on, on the page, but I can show you they are actually yellow. Or the other option is to get a set like these ones from Richie, which are bright yellow, uh, and trim one down, which is kind of what we used to do before grip shift even made grip shift compatible grips. Uh, hopefully that works, but the colour looks right, more importantly, so I'm guessing you're doing it to sort of customise the bike. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, John Cruikshank says, does a high pivot design have an impact on gear ratios? Uh, no, really. Uh, the only thing that will have a massive, or any sort of impact on gear ratios would be the size of the wheels. So if you were going to a high pivot bike and you're going for a bigger wheel than you had before, say you were on a 27.5 and you went to a 29, the thing you're gonna notice is generally you wanna kind of go down two teeth in your front chambering with a 29 inch wheel. 
Um, but really, that's about it. There could well be some friction in the system depending on what particular bike you have because of the fact you've got an additional wheel on there. I think most of the designs now kind of got around that by using bigger idler wheels and stuff, but some of the early bikes with smaller idler wheels that didn't rotate too freely had more friction. It might have made it feel like the gear ratio was different, but it's not the gear on there. Um, next one is from Rafe Home. I'm looking for, that's oh, the last one as well, looking for a new fork. Do I need to worry about the ride height or do I just look at the travel and if it's in the range for the bike, it should fit fine? I don't know if different 150 mil forks have different ride heights and I can't find them listed on many manufacturers' websites. Okay, so what you're looking for is the axle to crown measurement and you will find that on uh, most major manufacturers of suspension forks. That's the number that counts, not the number of the travel of the fork because that deals with the static height of your bike. So the geometry chart for your bike, unless it says dynamic or sagged, what it means, the geometry that you see in the chart is how it is when you're not on the bike. You want to maintain that as much as possible. So for example, if you went for a fork that was 10 mil longer than your existing one, you could lose a degree off that head angle. That might sound nice because it slackens it a bit, but you're also raising the front end, so you're gonna to have to compensate for that. You're raising the bottom bracket and you're slackening the seat angle. So ideally you wanna go like for like. Now you could, for example, go for a fork with 10 mil more travel and it be just 10 mil longer, but the fact that you're gonna to have to have that fork sag a fraction more just because it's a slightly longer fork and 25 to 30% sag like for like between them is gonna be a little lower. So you'll notice it a little less but ideally stick for the same axle to crown if you want your bike to perform as it did before. Uh, like I said, you will find the information on the websites. A to C or axle to crown is what you're looking for. Uh, hopefully that's been helpful. Uh, thanks for the great questions. Hit us up with more questions down there. And if you want to see any of us collaborating with other, other presenters, of course, EMBN and GMBN, let us know. And we'll see you in another video soon. Ta-ra.